Hello, everybody, and welcome again to another um, OpenShift Commons briefing. This time, um, again, surprise, surprise, we're talking about operators. Um, and this time, we're going to talk a little bit about um, Helm and Helm operators. And Rob Sumsky is here, and Andrew, uh, Andrew, not Andrew, Evan Cordell as well um, has, has joined us to really see what we can do um, to help people who are working in Helm understand operators and everything they need to know. So, Rob, take it away. Hi everyone, thanks for joining. Um, uh, as Diane said, I'm joined here um, with one of my colleagues, Evan, and so uh, we're gonna talk to you about um, Helm operators, kind of uh, when you should use one, why you should use one, other things you need to know, um, and uh, hopefully you'll find that really interesting. Uh, so I've got some slides we can talk about, uh, then we can take some live questions for folks that are on the call today. Um, maybe we'll just have some general discussions, um, dig into some of Evan's thoughts on this. Um, but for now, I'll just walk through some of these slides. So as Diane said, I'm a product manager here at OpenShift um, and was around uh, in the early days of when this operator concept um, was initiated. And so I um, want to share some information with you about kind of how we see um, that overlap between Helm and Helm operators and when to use our Helm SDK. Um, so what we're going to talk about today, uh, where Helm fits in our ecosystem, um, the operator maturity model, if you're not um, familiar with that, and then uh, digging into exactly how our Helm uh, operator SDK works and when to use it um, and how it enables simpler Git ops. Um, it's important before we begin just to talk about kind of uh, adoption phases of applications on Kubernetes. Um, and it kind of roughly follows when some of these features were put into Kubernetes. Um, so first, you know, you've got your stateless apps, um, super easy to run these with uh, replica sets and deployments. Um, and, you know, then the Kube community uh, rapidly progressed into running uh, stateful apps. Um, this is where we have um, staple sets for running, you know, simple uh, Postgres deployments and things like that. And under the hood, we got um, the container storage interface and some of the storage mechanisms that, you know, map uh, disks around as pods are moving around the cluster. Um, and then finally, we got to running full distributed systems on Kubernetes. And this involves things that actually, you know, aren't uh, abstractions in Kubernetes itself. There's no object for data rebalancing, but that's super important for running um, these distributed databases. Um, Kube has some primitives for auto-scaling uh, horizontally and vertically, um, but having your application be aware of that, when to do that, how to trigger it. Um, same with CMS upgrades. We've got some um, things in deployments and staple sets for doing these you know, rolling updates, um, but how do you make the application aware? How do you do health checking while that's happening? Um, things like that are where operators come in. You need this higher level primitive that's kind of using all of these tools that we have to run these systems. Um, this intersects uh, pretty well with the operator maturity model, um, and this is kind of a five-phase thing that we see um, for how do you get to kind of the nirvana here that we want is this cloud-like experience where you've got this application that's auto-tuning, auto-scaling, just works the way that it should, has all the, um, the logic for how to run this application baked into it. Um, and so this kind of, uh, there's a gamut here where you don't have to kind of meet every single need based on what your application's doing. Um, and this maturity model does map um, pretty directly to some of the uh, SDK flavors that we have today in our operator framework. Um, so the Helm SDK um, is towards the beginning of this phase, which is um, getting the install and upgrade uh, going. This is, you know, where Helm is stamping out your deployments and staple sets and your config uh, maps and secrets and services and all that. Um, and you can do uh, some relatively simple upgrades. Um, if you've got a stateless web app going from version A to version B, uh, Helm can uh, get you there pretty easily. Um, if you've got deeper needs, if you need to do uh, some of the things like I was talking about, um, do data rebalancing or upgrade one tier of your application before the other tier of the application, and wait for that to return healthy, um, you need a little bit of a higher level uh, kind of language there to do that. And so this is where Ansible and Go come in, and those can kind of address this entire maturity model. Um, you can uh, read more about this. We've got some blog posts on it, and I'm happy to take any questions on it. Um, so this gets us to Helm itself. Um, not even uh, talking about the operator for a second. Let's just break down what Helm does for you. Um, so Helm is kind of two main parts. There's the templating part. You know, I've got a, this high-level configuration that I want to um, give you, and then uh, I want to go through and template all my Kubernetes objects. The 
um, create the services, create the deployments. If I say uh, replicas equals two, then you know set that in a deployment, but maybe you need to generate um, a secret so that these things can talk to each other securely. Um, whatever it is, you know, and this gets templated out and you know out pops maybe 30 different objects that are um, represent your application. Um, and so you interact with that via the Helm CLI to kick that off. Um, and once that templating has happened, uh, there's this whole, you know, starting all of those things uh, on the cluster itself. So there's communication with your Kubernetes cluster. Um, and that's just things like read uh, from your kube config if you've got a cluster already installed. Um, if you haven't installed Taylor on it, um, the CLI can do that for you. Um, if you've already got Taylor running, it's talk to Tiller. Um, Tiller is this component, by the way, that sits in your cluster and it's kind of root on the cluster. And it's what talks to all of your namespaces and creates all of these objects. Um, and then every time you do a new release of uh, Helm, you know, it'll run through those templates and then either submit those objects or apply changes to those running objects. Um, and that's kind of how the ecosystem works. Um, I think it's useful to compare and contrast this with how the Helm uh, operator uh, and the SDK works, um, just so we get a kind of sense of when you can use this and how it's useful. Um, so uh, I, these red bits are some of the changes that happen when you use the Helm um, SDK that we have. Um, and basically, we're using all the same templating. So you can reuse a chart. Um, if you give it the same inputs, you'll get the same outputs. Um, we actually import the Helm libraries under the hood. So you're getting the exact you know, bit for bit code that runs Helm. Um, but what we do is instead of using a Helm CLI, you actually um, map your template, your chart, to a custom resource definition. This is the extension mechanism in Kubernetes um, so that you're extending Kubernetes just like you have your built-in deployments of replica sets. Now you can have a new MongoDB object or a FUBAR web app object. Um, and that is managed by an operator. Um, now what the operator is doing is actually doing this templating logic for you, just like um, you would use the Helm CLI for, but you can just use the, uh, the Kubernetes CLI once you have your operator installed on a cluster. Um, once it's installed on a cluster, this is where um, a lot of the changes happen, and this is um, kind of where we see uh, like the uh, Tiller model in Helm is kind of insecure. Um, you know, this thing, it's a um, listening outside of the cluster, so you know um, you're, you have an API that you're exposing, and then this uh, daemon that's running on the cluster runs as root. It's got access to all your namespaces, all your secrets. It can modify your nodes. It can modify everything about your cluster, um, and we don't love that. Um, so uh, what we do is this operator first runs in the cluster, so it doesn't have to be exposed outside. Um, so any uh, mechanism that you use to communicate with the Kubernetes API today, um, how it's secured, all that, you know, you're just using that um, standard interface. And um, you can lock down this operator. So you can uh, say that this operator um, is only, you know, running in a specific namespace or namespaces. Um, and so what this um, Helm template can do is kind of um, limited to that namespace. Now you can also further lock it down for if your uh, Helm template is only uh, meant to create deployments and config, ma config maps and not secrets, for example, um, that this operator can't read or manage secrets at all. Um, so we're leveraging those Kubernetes RBAC primitives um, to kind of get the most minimal set of rules that is required for this chart to run. Um, then of course, uh, it's always watching for changes. Um, so instead of having to manually invoke the uh, Helm CLI and do a rollout of um, your application, what you do is just edit your custom resource, um, edit your MongoDB deployment or your FUBAR web app object. Um, and if you change a config, the uh, Helm operator will immediately re-template all of your uh, values and then apply those onto the cluster. Um, so you get this very kube native experience, um, but you're reusing your same Helm charts. Um, so it's kind of the best of both worlds. Um, another uh, nice benefit of this is um, because the operator and the chart are baked together, you actually have this immutable outcome um, where you can, given the same set of values and the same version of the operator installed, you know you always receive the same output. Um, so this is really great for integrating into uh, CI systems and other workflows where you don't want to, um, you know, have this kind of a snowflake thing pop out. You want to test something and then distribute it to your customers 
or your different environments and know that it's going to bring up the same application every time. Um, so that's kind of a, a little overview of how the Helm Operator SDK works um, in uh, kind of under the hood, if you will. Um, your experience um, is, is very not, much not changed. You're using your same chart. Um, you are getting a more secure um, and kube native way to interact with it, though. Um, if you're interested in what this looks like, um, now that we've talked about kind of the outcome side of it, um, so on the input side, um, if you were going to make a Tomcat operator um, and have a, a Tomcat chart, um, this is all you have to do. You say that you're going to build a, an operator of type Helm, um, give it your charts. You can also give this you know, a file location um, and things like that if you have local charts. Um, and what this will do is pop out um, both that uh, CRD, the object that represents this Tomcat installation, and then a container of the operator. Um, this is you know, the, that actual code that's going to run in your cluster um, that is constantly applying those changes to your, um, your Helm charts. Um, there's some other metadata as well that it gets output um, so that you can successfully run this on a cluster. Um, under the hood, kind of what this looks like from a, a process perspective is we're going to take that uh, Tomcat chart and build it into the container with the operator. Um, and so now that is that immutable uh, bundle that you have for, in this case, version 1.2.7. Um, and then once you have that operator running with 1.2.7, um, when you uh, pass in these, uh, this custom object, the Tomcat object, um, the spec uh, field down there where we have replica count and max active sessions are the values uh, for your chart. Um, and those will get um, templated immediately upon change um, and applied to your running instances. Um, so this is how you would have a different set of um, config and production and staging um, or a different set of versions in production and staging, as you can see um, in that get Tomcats output from the bottom. So as you can see, this is very kube native, um, feels really great, has a, has a really great um, kind of reconfiguration experience. Um, and you can always go and instantiate uh, new objects at your leisure. Um, this is very self-service, which is great. Um, and where that really matters is if you have this uh, operator running on the cluster, but you have several different teams that all, you know, consume your um, app or your kind of microservice as a dependency, they can easily spin up um, a copy of your production uh, config, uh, which is really great for running in their CI testing and that type of thing. Um, Evan, feel free to jump in here if you've got any comments on any of this stuff, by the way. Uh, sure, there's one thing I would add to this, uh, which is just that, um, the Helm operator is not necessarily a tool designed to take any Helm chart and turn it into an operator, but rather to take applications that can be that have simple life cycles and can be represented as simple Helm charts and make those uh, give you like an easy way to make an operator for those types of applications. Yeah, that's a really great point. And then you know, if you start out with a simple application and you're using um, our Helm operator, and then you want to kind of progress up that maturity curve. Um, there's no reason that you can't, you know, using the same type of objects, um, then swap out the technology or, or build upon it um, slowly over time to make it smarter and smarter. Um, so this gets into the meat of when to use a Helm operator. Um, and I want to go back to um, the chart that we looked at in the beginning, um, kind of the, the types of applications that you can run on Kubernetes. Um, and it's worth talking about just kind of how Helm works. Um, you know, it directly uses Kubernetes objects. So um, these first two um, groups of applications, stateless and stateful apps, um, using, you know, these kube objects directly, um, no surprise there, works really, really great. Um, all you're doing there is, you know, uh, doing a, a, effectively a kube cuddle apply or create on those objects um, and, you know, obviously templating them out. Um, so doing uh, upgrades of these, if those applications are resilient to just, you know, um, a rolling update or whatever the Kubernetes primitives are um, for rolling this out, going to work really, really great as a Helm operator. And as Evan mentioned, these are, you know, um, applications that have fairly simple um, life cycles. Now, where you run into trouble with this is in the distributed systems, because these capabilities aren't built into Kube, but there isn't a, uh, you know, a Kube object that Helm can instantiate to do data rebalancing. Um, that's something that needs to kind of live at a little bit of a higher level of abstraction at your application tier. 
Um, and that's where these things are just not possible to put into a Helm operator. So if that describes your application or where you think you're going to be in the very near future, um, you know, starting with a Helm operator is probably not the best choice. Um, but for most applications, um, or if you can decompose your application into a tier that works well for um, a Helm operator, you know, you can always have these operators work together. Um, I think that's a pretty common pattern that we'll start seeing, especially as the lifecycle manager um, knows about dependencies between operators. Um, so you can represent, you know, a front end that might be a Helm chart um, based operator and then a back end that might be a more complicated Go or Ansible operator and then have those work together to deploy your staging environments, your production, et cetera. Any other comments, Evan? Nope, that's all good. All right. I think this is the last one. Okay. Um, I just want to kind of bring this all together and um, talk about what this actually gets you as an outcome for if you're an enterprise or a small software company or um, somebody that ships software out to other consumers is that you have this um, really simple GitOps workflow where you've got all of your, um, you know, your complex logic about how to run your app, whatever the, the business logic is for that, um, all represented in this operator. Um, such that when you are testing um, any of your dependencies and, and uh, revving those independently, you're really only interacting with these high-level objects. So imagine a um, CI and CD workflow, um, uh, you know, a GitOps uh, quote-unquote workflow, where you're just interacting with these two objects you see on the left. Um, I've got uh, MongoDB that provides my stateful storage, um, and then I've got this custom front end um, that, you know, has some um, different limits applied to it. And if you want to tweak some of the values of those um, for, you know, production versus staging, you're changing this high-level config. The operator is making all that happen for you. If you're distributing this software out to another team or to a customer of yours, um, they don't need to know about any of this stuff. They just need to have the operator installed and then give this really high-level config. Um, so this is easier to reason about in uh, pull requests if you're changing some of these values. If you're bumping different versions, making sure everything gets tested, um, it's a really, really great experience for doing that GitOps workflow. Um, I think that's all I have other than some of these links. Um, if you want to check out the Helm SDK, uh, we have a user guide. That's the first one. Um, tomorrow, we have our um, SIG for um, operators meeting. Um, and we're going to have a bunch of really great discussion there. Um, this is where a bunch of um, practitioners and operator authors come together to solve problems together, show off some of the work that they've done, as well as kind of you know, solve problems and push the community forward in some of the tools that we have. Um, and then lastly, I wanted to point out operatorhub.io, which is where we have a lot of the um, operators um, that exist in the world today listed with some documents.